OK, so we will continue what we started two days ago. And uh, we have the nice introduction about surjectivity and uh, the uh, Garden of Eden theorem uh, by uh, Puru during his talk, even if uh, he's putting time the wrong way. But it's because he's coming from Turku, so it's not his fault. Uh, let me just uh, remind you where we are. We are into the properties of cellular automata that we want to compute. So we are given a cellular automaton, and we want to test if some properties there uh, is true or not. And so I was uh, first giving some definitions about uh, um, discrete dynamical systems. I will continue this way. And then I will investigate first the immediate properties of the cellular automata, and then some more dynamical properties about attractors of those objects. So the object we look at is a cellular automaton. So you have a finite set of states. You have some radius that give each cell a boundary of the part of the configuration it looks at around itself. And you have a local rule. And I have a pointer today. So you have a local rule that permits to, for each cell to compute the next state based on what it sees around itself. So that's the object. Then you have the configurations, which are just paintings of uh, your grid with colors. And when you draw configurations, there is no problem of piling them up or down. It's just the object you look at. And then the global maps applies uh, uniformly the rule. And here comes the problem. You do space-time diagrams by peeling stuff up, of course, like that. So this is a different rule from uh, previous time. You have some configuration in the bottom. And uh, the rule applies from bottom to top, applying each time the global rule of the automaton. Here, it's a different one from previous uh, time. Um, you can see that in this example also, there are some kind of moving particles and collisions. Of course, if you take a rule at random, you will not always see something like that. Um, there's been a lot of literature on cellular automata about what you expect to see when you look at a random local rule. I won't talk about it. But if you want some uh, pointer for that, uh, just ask any random people doing cellular automata in the room. There are several of them. They can uh, give you precise information about that. OK, so we were trying to look at cellular automata as a dynamical system. So we wanted some topological space and a continuous function. That's where we stopped uh, last time. We did put some topology on our set of configuration. And uh, an anonymous uh, uh, people from the room told me it was uh, not Ville, certainly, because it's anonymous. That, that definition is not completely correct, because you need to close that set by uh, all those operations there. Thank you, anonymous reader. So the topology is metric and compact. And um, all that topology uh, resolves around those cylinders. And cylinders here as a very, is a very combinatorial object. It's just uh, finite patterns of cells centers on, centered on 0. And um, all the other cells are free to take any state. So this is the cylinder white, black, gray, gray, white, for example. And all the red cells here can be any cell from uh, any state from my state set. And what is nice with cylinders is that it's a base of Klopen sets that generate uh, all the open sets and uh, all the closed sets of our topology. So I have a notation here. A sub-cylinder is a cylinder which is uh, um, less specified than the other. So it's a really uh, an inclusion on the set of configurations. And I believe I stopped last time with the definition of the distance. So you get a metric by saying that two configurations at, at distance I but the configuration side by side, I look at difference, and uh, I search the difference that is uh, nearest from zero, 
and I take that distance to, to the distance, and you take the reverse of that. So far, so good. But the topology is not that uh, complicated, and it's good because we don't like complicated objects. We just like finite, trivial objects. So uh, actually, um, you can do almost everything in these settings, almost every basic thing, uh, by just considering uh, extraction arguments. So, for example, if you want to see that every sequence of configuration uh, admit uh, converging subsequence, the nice way to look at it is certainly by extraction like that. So you have a sequence of configurations. I will do it in 2D because it's more visual. So I have two dimensional configurations there, centered on zero. I have my infinite sequence of configuration. I put them on front of each other. And um, I look at a finite window in the center, window of radius r. The window is finite. So there are only finitely many possible ways to fill the window with my finite set of states. So certainly in my infinite sequence, there is one filling of the window that appears infinitely many often, right? So I choose that way to fill the center. I remove all the configurations which uh, do not fulfill that uh, condition. And I still have an infinite sequence of configurations. So I take a bigger radius and I iterate like that. I have a sequence of infinite sequence of configurations that converge to one unique configuration, the one for which I made all those choices all along the way. So it's written in a more formal way here, but uh, there are a bit too many indices and uh, exponents there for it to be readable. But essentially, it's converging to uh, the configuration that is equal to all my chosen um, centered uh, finite patterns. And it converges nicely. The distance is uh, 1 over 2 to the n between two successive configurations. Yep. Yeah. Question? Very important question. So uh, yeah. just is the, you have C n plus 1 i. So that means that you are looking, it's the next subsequence. And then of C to the n i plus 1, that means that you look at, that's the previous sequence. And the i plus 1 means that you are shifting the indices so that you get the first one. OK. So right. the is that the understanding? Yeah, I understand what you asked. So uh, the subscript here, the indice i, is uh, for the sequence of configuration. And the superscript 0 is because it's uh, the sequence number 0. Yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering about the role of the subscript i plus 1 there. Is, yeah. th is that the trick to make sure that you are not sort of forgetting all of them? Or what is the i plus? Maybe, maybe I'm. Uh, ah, OK. Let me look at it from uh, far away. OK. A cylinder and take subsequence uh, of. Yeah, sure. It's because we're doing some kind of diagonal uh, selection. Thank you. OK, so, but you can do your to everything and ev even define your topology with that. So it's a bit of a child play, but I like child play. So let me define Koenig trees like that. So you know Koenig's lemma? Koenig's lemma states that in every infinite tree with finite branching, there is uh, an infinite branch. And uh, if you take Koenig's lemma, it gives you some kind of uh, axiom of choice, which is uh, somewhere in between all the classical ones that you might know. Actually, it's about, if I remind correctly, it's about uh, choosing among uh, countable sequence of uh, finite sets, something like that. But we take it for granted, right? So what is a Koenig tree? A Koenig tree associated to a set of configuration, a set of uh, paintings of ZD, is simply a graph 
where uh, the vertices are all the cylinders that intersect my set of configurations. And uh, I have an edge from a cylinder to another if the first one is a sub-cylinder of the other and the difference is in radius is just one. Actually, if you take, the, of course, the transitive closure of uh, this set of edges, you obtain all the cylinders which are sub-cylinders of another. Yes? So if you do that, you have an infinite tree with finite branching if the set C of configuration is non-empty. At the root of your uh, tree, you have uh, the whole set of configuration, the cylinder of radius minus one. And what is interesting in trees, of course, is topping the leaves, which are upwards, right? So uh, if you have a non-empty set of configuration, you have a non-empty uh, topping, and uh, we will write uh, as a AC bar, the set of configurations which are associated to your topping. Because what is a leaf in my infinite tree is just a path which is going to infinity. And a path is a sequence of cylinders which converge to a unique configuration. So my topping is really a set of configurations. And so uh, it corresponds to all configuration to which you can converge from the set C. And it, it's exactly the closure of C, right? Yes? Yeah, because they are not really leaves. That's true. It's uh, they are they are uh, at the end of the infinite converging sequence of cylinders. Yeah. Yeah, my my uh, trees uh, don't have leaves for real. And so, if you do that, you can define the topology by closed set, right? So you take uh, all those uh, Koenig uh, toppings. And you, of course, get exactly the counter topology because the complement of the toppings are uh, union of cylinders. And um, all the arguments you have in counter topology, like, uh, I don't know, looking at closed set with an empty interior or capacity argument, even bare theorem where if you, are, uh, uh, if you want to do funny things, you can do just with Koenig lemma in these settings. So if you don't like topology, you can think about toppings of uh, trees. And if you don't like that kind of object, I'm sorry, you can just think about counter topology. So let's go back to cellular automata, because that's what we want in the end, right? So what is continuity in this topology? So first, the Kloppen sets are just the finite unions of our cylinders. And they play a very important role there. And you see cylinders are sets of configurations that are defined just by a finite region. And because of that, um, the continuous functions in this topology are, in fact, local functions. So what is a local function? A local function is a map where uh, the, in the image, the, st the state in a particular position is completely defined by looking at some cylinder in the, the initial configuration. Um, you might think about it. It's not that complicated to see. But so for every position, if the map is local, there is a radius such that looking at that radius, you can completely uh, define the posi that position in the image. It's not completely a cell automaton yet. It's more like what Puru defined. It's a non-uniform cell automaton. So if we want uniformity, we just add the fact that it should be invariant by translation. And that's a famous uh, theorem indeed by uh, Curtis, Edlund, Linden, maybe Richardson, if you are more on the cell automata side, a bunch of people. And uh, what it says is that Cellular automata, the global maps of cellular automata, are exactly the continuous mappings that commute with uh, shift. So Puru defined shift. I need to redefine it here. What is the translation by k? Uh, oh, we had a problem with time. We have a problem also with shift. But you're shifting to the left, I shift to the right. But it's equivalent, right? So <laughs> sigma k, what is it? By a translation by vector k, 
in your image, in position p, you see what was in position p, p minus k in the previous uh, configuration. So moving, shifting, translations. OK, so cellular automata are really continuous map uh, commuting with the shift, or as some people like to say, endomorphism of the shift uh, dynamical system. It means that with this dual nature, I can choose when I want either to define local rules or to take cellular automata and compose them, or even because we are in uh, compact settings, um, if I have some cellular automaton which is uh, uh, bijective, I know that the reverse is also a cellular automaton, right? So that's very nice. And that's where subshifts arrive. So the other object we have to talk about are subshift. So what is a subshift is exactly what, we, what is uh, uh, behind uh, those uh, um, invariant sets. Uh, a subshift is a closed set of configuration which is uh, invariant by translation. An example. Uh, that you might have seen, but not on Z, but on N, when you've done your walnut exercises yesterday. Uh, I think so. Um, consider the set of configuration on the alphabet AB, where when you see a B in a position, you have A in the next position, always. This set is certainly closed, because that property is a property that, uh, when you do an extraction, will be still fulfilled. It's a local property. And it's invariant by translation because it's for all positions there. So uh, subshift play a natural role when studying cellular automata. And uh, I need to say a few things also because this afternoon you will play with DD, which is a tool working on subshift. So what do I know about subshift? Not a lot, but uh, first, the language of a subshift, the set of finite patterns that appear inside the subshift, um, it plays an important role there. In particular, the subshift is completely characterized by its language, right? Because if you take the language and if you construct all the configuration you can where all the finite patterns are in the language, you obtain indeed an element of the subshift. Uh, beware, of course, that uh, if you took a strange uh, language, the language of the closure might not be exactly what you had in the beginning. You need to be a little careful about your sets of configuration. So, but language characterizes the subshift, but people doing symbolic dynamics don't like the language. They prefer the complement, that is forbidden patterns. So, of course, as the set of forbidden patterns is the complement of the language, it also characterizes the subshift, right? But what is nice about forbidden patterns is that you can look at minimal sets of forbidden words and uh, those might even be finite in some case. So subshift can be defined by minimal sets of forbidden words, minimal for inclusion, and uh, my set X from before, which had a complicated uh, definition, now has a very simple definition, is the set of configurations that avoids the words BB. Julien, if I say some uh, strange things, please don't hesitate to say something. So, uh, since you say that I yeah. should not hesitate, uh, no, it's I, it, not can you go to the previous line? Yeah, <laughs> sorry? Can you go to the previous line? Yeah, maybe. So this second proposition is uh, not true. So even a very simple example, <laughs> like you take an empty subshift, you can define it by forbidding A and B, or you can define it by forbidding oh, you mean there A, is no A, unicity A, of... Uh, hmm? It's not unique, right? Yes, it's not bijection, but it's okay. okay. And no, I'm, I'm just saying that he's saying that they are uh, they are in bijection with minimal sets of forbidden words for set inclusion. So this is not true because you because you can define you take the binary subshift over A and B symbols and you forbid both A and B, now it's empty. Or you can forbid A A. A, B, B, A, and B, B, these four words, it is still empty, so yeah, not yeah, set yeah, inclusion. Yeah. 
in one dimension there is a statement of this spirit in higher dimensions I'm not sure that there is a st statement like this in this spirit someone might know better than me but okay so this is wrong don't uh, believe that and uh, okay I will write something correct in the slides in uh, after looking at uh, the proper way to I state it's, it. It's minimal for the proper order. Yeah, yeah, for the proper order, yes. Like yeah. looking at yeah, uh, minimal word and so on, but as this one is wrong, if I yeah. put a second, you know, it's not very good. So, yeah, completely wrong. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, I believe the other things are not completely wrong. So, uh, what then you can, sometimes you can take a finite set of forbidden patterns when you are uh, lucky with your, uh, your subshift. So uh, those are the SFT, the subshifts of finite type. And uh, what is ni nice about the subshift of finite type is that if you have a cellular automaton, as it's defined by local rule, you can easily find all the finite patterns in a pre-image that would generate uh, forbidden words of your subshift. So the set of SFT is uh, preserved when you take the pre-image by your cellular automaton. Right? And uh, indeed, SFT are really uh, the same thing as tilings, that is colorings on which you have constraints by finite patterns that you see in a finite window. So there will be a very nice talk about tilings just after this uh, lecture. Uh, Chaim will talk about a lot of nice things, and I, even I saw hats uh, falling from a bag, so it's exciting. Uh, but let me say some basic stuff. So pre-image uh, by a CA of an SFT is an SFT, but if you take the image of an SFT, it's not always uh, finite. Uh, it defines a set of subshifts which are called suffix subshifts. Um, and uh, in dimension one, it turns out that suffix subshifts are subshifts for which the language is a regular language. But in dimension two, it's not the case anymore. You can also see uh, suffix subshift as an image of tiling by uh, some local map also, of course. Do you get all regular languages? Um, so, because of these minimality things, uh, if you take, you, you can do it the other way. If you take any language, you can get a subshift where those patterns are forbidden. And uh, for this subshift, there is a minimal uh, language for the proper order. Um, but that might be different from the language that you choose. Like if you take, um, Yeah, it will, oh, it will always be a subshift, right? And uh, so it will always be suffix, yes? Alors the, uh, yes, because the idea is to uh, construct uh, tiles that would mimic the automaton, somehow. So um, you construct some uh, tiles that you will put in every position on Z. In the tile, you have the state of your uh, finite automaton. And uh, on the borders, you have colors that correspond to the letters that you read uh, in uh, your world. Or you can do the dual if you prefer. You put the letter here and the state here. And then you do the transition of your finite automaton along the, those uh, color constraints so that uh, every finite pattern is uh, in your language somehow. And uh, in the end, to remove the construction uh, colors, you just project on your letter using a cellar uh, automaton, yeah. Something like that. But then, of course, there is a problem of the initial state. Okay. But that's the idea. No remark, no question, nothing too wrong? Okay. Let's go back to cellular automata then. Uh, okay, so we, we last time we talked about configurations and uh, 
there were two kinds of configurations that were very natural. There are periodic configurations, where you have just a finite pattern of states, and then you have periods to complete your whole uh, feeling of the space. So this is just a definition that says this. Uh, you're periodic with a set of, uh, of d different periods uh, if your configuration in p repeats in uh, p plus uh, any vector of uh, multiples of those pi's. And uh, when I look at my cellular automaton, if the rule is g, because I said previously that cellular automata are the same as a global rule, so I don't give the detail anymore, then GP would be the restriction of this uh, cellular automaton to periodic configurations. Then you have S finite configuration. So S is a Kiesen state, meaning that if you only see S, you get S in the image. And um, uh, GF is uh, the restriction of the cellular automaton to finite configuration. So you might ask me what you do if you don't have keys and states. Um, the idea is the following. If you take a configuration which is uh, filled with just one color because of symmetries, the image is also filled with only one color. So ultimately, you have a cycle of size, let's say, k. And uh, your cellular automaton, iterated k times, is still a cellular automaton, and he has a keys and state. So don't worry, if you study just uh, cellular automata with uh, uh, case and states, you are not missing much of them. OK, then given a set of configuration, I can study injectivity, subjectivity, and bijectivity of my map, right? So injective, I don't know if I need to define that, right? So injective. Uh, if you take two different configurations, so as an image, and uh, surjective, you can go everywhere. And bijective, you're both injective and surjective. And I have a, a fourth definition, which is reversible. You're reversible if you are bijective, but more than that, there is an automaton which goes uh, downwards from top to bottom. So the first remark is that every bijective cellular automaton is also reversible. And uh, you can do it by hand using extraction argument, or you can just uh, convince yourself that uh, in a compact uh, um, setting, when you have uh, B-continuous maps, uh, the reverse uh, is also uh, local and shift invariant. OK, and then I will come to what Puru extended for non-uniform CA. So we have what we call Garden of Eden configuration. A Garden of Eden is somewhere you can never come back to. So uh, it's in the bottom, and uh, it can never appear, appear later. Uh, OK, so of course. Garden of Eden are some things that block surjectivity. So a cellular automaton is surjective if and only if he has no Garden of Eden. But Garden of Eden are whole configuration. And there is a local notion which is a bit of the same kind, is the notion of an orphan. What is an orphan? It's a finite pattern that has no pre-image. And of course, if you have an orphan, then you can construct a garden of Eden just by extending the orphan. But the reciprocal is also true. If you have a garden of Eden, you should have an orphan, because if every finite pattern of your garden of Eden has a pre-image, a finite pre-image, by extraction on this set of pre-image, you construct a pre-image of the garden of Eden. And here comes the famous uh, moore my hill set of theorems. So the first one says that when a, um, a cellular automaton is surjective, then it's injective when you restrict yourself to finite configuration. And the uh, hill theorem says the converse. So in particular, if a cellular automaton is injective, then it's still injective when restricted on finite configuration, thus by uh, 
mild theorem is also surjective. So in cellular automata, injectivity implies bijectivity, which turns out to be the same as reversibility. So injective cellular automata are reversible cellular automata. Uh, we will prove that uh, more mild theorem because it's a nice thing to prove. And for that, we need a technical uh, lemma, which is uh, written here. Um, let's fix uh, four uh, integ integer values, d, n, n, and r. And you can always find k big enough so that the quantity on the left is smaller than the quantity on the right. Uh, right now, it's mysterious, but in one picture, it would be clear, it will be very clear why we want that. Let me just write down the lemma. Okay, something like that. Oops. And I have a picture also. And this is the picture. So the picture consists of a repetition of a finite pattern. It's exactly k copies of n by n squares. Like that. So it's kn by kn. And uh, all those squares, they have some bound, some, uh, some border, some uh, border of size r. Something like that. So borders of size R everywhere. Like that. And so that if you look in particular at what happens when you start here until here, you have Kn minus 2R. OK, those are the tricks, and then comes the proof. So first, we are given a surjective cellular automaton, J, and we want to prove that it's uh, injective on uh, finite. So we will uh, suppose that G is not injective on finite configuration. What does it mean that it's not injective on finite configurations? It means that you can find two finite patterns, P1, P2, that maps to the same image. So this is my P1, my P2. Around P1 and P2, you have uh, the Kirsten state everywhere. So I can put them in uh, some very nice n by n square with a border of size r, which is filled with the Kirsten state S. This is just S everywhere. Right? And both those patterns map to the same image. So n by n goes to n minus r by n minus r. Because the local rules cannot compute what's on the borders of, the, of your finite configuration. OK, let's see. Oh, yes, the size, of course, is n to the d, because we are in dimension d. So it's n to the d by, uh, on each side. It's bordered uh, by uh, radius r uh, um, border field with s. And uh, if you take any configuration where P1 appears, you can replace it by P2, and you obtain the same image. Now, you take these big pictures. You consider all the fillings of this Kn by Kn square. And you count. You count the number of fillings. You count the number of image. And uh, 
you use the inequality on the top. So let's see. Um, the image is Kn minus 2R by Kn minus 2R by Kn minus 2R. So this is the size of the image. It's filled by n possible state. So this is the number of images of my <coughs> Kn by Kn pattern. And the number of pre-image is the number of ways to fill the biggest pattern. It's n to the nd. That's the number of ways to fill a, a small a square. Minus 1 because p1 and p2 have the same image. So no need to take both of them. And then you have k to the d, to the d uh, squares inside this. And you see that the number of image at some point will get bigger than the number of pre-image. <coughs> so this is uh, Moore, if I uh, remember correctly. And my yield is the same argument with the same picture, but uh, you just do, don't do the same <coughs> gymnastic. You do it the other way. So if you are not subjective, you have an orphan. The orphan is a way to uh, fill, let's see, uh, the, the orphan is also in the small uh, n by n square like that. And what do you want to prove is that you're not injective on finite configuration. So uh, you count, yet again, the number of configurations that you have. So you take all the patterns which uh, are images of that big square. It's uh, that quantity. You take all the S finite uh, pre-image. And because of the uh, orphan, you have to remove one again. And you get the same inequality, and you conclude. Yeah, that's the proof, more or less. So people have played with that a lot. And uh, they made a very nice uh, picture like that. OK, so more my hill, it's uh, the line on at the bottom, right? So what does it say? That surjective is the same as injective on finite configuration. It is exactly the same as uh, this mysterious set that we will see just after being the set of every configuration. On the top, you have the reversible, which are bijective, which are injective solar automata. And you have some intermediate clays, classes there. Uh, for example, being injective on periodic uh, configuration is the same as being bijective. And you see there are small triangles and, and squares there. So some of those implications are not true in uh, every dimension. For example, if you take uh, the triangle ones, so let's see on the top right. If you're bijective on uh, periodic configuration in dimension 1, it's the same as being injective. Starting from dimension 2, it's not the case anymore. It's different. You can construct counterexamples. And we have nice open problems, of course. That's the little squares. We know what happens in dimension 1, and in dimension 2, no idea. So please, if you have an idea, Come discuss with us. So for example, if you are injective on periodic configuration, you are uh, bijective on finite configuration in dimension 1. And in dimension 2, we don't know. Of course, uh, it's not three independent questions. If you solve the right one, you solve some others. Just follow the, the arrows there. So I won't prove all the implications, because we have a, a talk about timings just after. So uh, let me give some uh, examples there. For example, uh, injective on periodic configuration implies bijective on periodic configuration. Why is it so? Because when you are injective on periodic configuration, cellular automata can only decrease the period because of the symmetry. So if you want to be injective on periodic configuration, in fact, you need uh, to send a certain amount of periodic configuration of period P on a set of the same size, and, or a little bigger because you have smaller configuration. But you cannot go to smaller configuration because they are already used for the smallest periodic configuration. So no possibility other than being periodic. Uh, bijective, sorry. Sir. 
Second uh, proposition, surjective and finite implies injective and finite. So the key here is to use uh, first the fact that finite configurations are dense in the whole set of configuration. So if you are surjective and finite, uh, if you would not be injective and finite configuration, um, so what would that mean? Can I do that proof actually this morning? Uh, let's see. Oh, oh but uh, because of density, it says something in the... <coughs> you go through Mumai Hill, so you want really to prove that uh, then you're, you're subjective in the whole set of configuration, right? Because Mumai Hill says that injective and finite is the same as subjective. So as it's dense, it, if you would not be subjective, you would reconstruct some problem on, on finite there. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the whole details in my head, but I think what I said is not completely false. So those are for positive uh, implications. For the negative one, you need to construct counterexamples. And uh, basically, most of them you do with two rules. So to prove uh, some of them, you use the XOR rule that you will experiment uh, this afternoon in DD. What is the XOR rule? It's just the addition modulo 2. <coughs> right? So if you take the cellular automaton that does addition modulo 2, every configuration has exactly two pre-images, which are the complement of each other. Um, I'm doing it with the neighborhood of a cell and one of its neighbor. Right? So I do the addition modulo 2. And so this automaton is uh, indeed surjective. It's uh, quite easy to construct a pre-image for a configuration. The truc qui est face est là. So let me do it in dimension one because it's easy to do it like that. So imagine that every cell, look at the cell on its right, and given x and y, it computes x plus 1 modulo 2. With uh, two states, like that. Then if you take any configuration, you can easily construct uh, Pre-image, you fix one cell in the middle with the value you want, be it 0 or 1. And then you just use the, the permutivity of the addition to fill the rest, right? So this a should be a x plus the things that goes here. So here you put x or a, and you continue like that. So that would be x or a, x or b etc. The same goes to the left, of course. And uh, or if you don't want to do it to the left, you can use it to construct half a configuration. And then you move your cursor. And by extraction, you do everything. And of course, if you take the complement of your configuration, uh, it's just like adding one everywhere. The two ones will cancel when you apply the local rule. And uh, so you have your two pre-image. OK, but if you look at finite configurations, and that's the trick, if you have a finite configuration with a number of ones which is even, then your pre-image are one pre-image with only zeros on both on the left and the right, and one with ones on the left and the right. But if the number of one is odd in your finite configuration, then your pre-image have different values on both sides. And the problem here is that none of those two pre-images are finite, right? Because finite is having a constant uh, background. So that's why uh, when you are subjective, you're not 
always surjective and finite, and because of the XOR and the odd number of, of one's uh, configurations. There is a variant of that, which is controlled XOR. In controlled XOR, you have uh, two bits per cell. There is a first bit, which control whether or not you will do the XOR on the second bit. So when the first bit is zero, your cell always uh, stays in the same state. And when the control bit is one, you do the XOR with the second value of your right neighbor. What is nice about this control XOR is that it's surjective on finite configuration because you put 0, 0 everywhere in the background. And uh, then you get trouble with injectivity. You might think about it a little. Yeah, you can see it like that. Yes, it's OK. It's uh, some kind of non-uniformity with two rules, which are the constant rule and the, the XOR, yes. OK, so, but I, I was talking about computing in the beginning. We compute nothing right, right now. So, so um, if I give you a cellular automaton by its local rule, how can you test, for example, if it's injective? Or how can you test if it's subjective? So there is a nice tool for that. But as I am in Marseille, I should say something before introducing the object. So uh, most people call it the Bruyne graph. But in Marseille, <laughs> no, not most people. Sorry. <laughs> no, <it's not laughs> I, uh, no, let me rephrase, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, in my community, most people call it the Bruyne graph. That's OK, I think. So I yeah. also call this the Yeah, but some people in Marseille call it uh, rosy graph. That's not true. No, that's not true? It's something else. Sorry? A subgraph of this. A subgraph is of this is the rosy graph. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I am sure that there are people who have called this rosy graph. Yeah, we have seen them. I have, I have, I have but reviewed a paper where it's called rosy graph. Oh. <laughs> but it's OK. <laughs> it's OK. The same way that people in Turku have time going down, <laughs> <laughs> you can call it as you want. Uh, the object is more interesting than the name, I think. So, so what is a De Bruyne graph? Um, the idea is to help you work on the configuration in dimension one. And uh, remembering enough information during your work in the, 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 I call it the state, because it's an automaton, but in the vertex of your graph, so that you have all the finite patterns that permits to compute the image by the local rule. That's the idea. So if you have a cellular automaton of radius r, you would construct a graph where uh, every uh, vertex is labeled by two times r values that you've read until now. And you have a vertex. For example, if you are in 0, 0, you have read 0 and 0. If you read, for example, a 1, then you will move to 0, 1. You forget the first letter, and you add the letter you read at the end of the world. So it's done in a suffix way. Of course, you can do the same if you want with the prefix. You can go left or right. It's the same, right? So this is the graph. And uh, the, all the B infinite path inside this graph uh, correspond to exactly one configuration of my set of uh, states. So For example, the information of the particular TA is just on the labels of the edges. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's the idea. So um, <coughs> infinite paths in the graph uh, correspond to configuration, and the infinite set of values you read on the label correspond to the image configuration. So. I don't know what is my example. I think my example is, is a bit, it's a shift, right? Shift uh, to the left. Yes. So the nice thing about this object is that it's finite. It's a finite automaton in this guise, but there is no initial state yet and no accepting state. And we will use it, of course, to decide properties. So for example, subjectivity in dimension one, what is being subjective? It means that all the configurations are obtained in the image of all the configurations. It means that the language of uh, the image of all configuration is the full language. So you take your De Bruyne graph, you put uh, all state as initial states, you put 
all states as finite states, and you compute the language of this finite automaton. If it's full, then the automaton is surjective. Yeah, this was done by Amoroso and Pat uh, in the early uh, 70s. Of course, in dimension two, it doesn't work, right? Because uh, you don't see how to go both north and east, up and down. It's complicated. <coughs> so surjectivity in dimension one, no problem. Regular languages, easy. You take your tool, your automata library, and you just you play with that. I, they will do that this afternoon? Sorry. No? Testing surjectivity? Uh, it's possible in DD? Oh. Uh, internally, yes. Uh, <coughs> OK. Uh, so what about injectivity, then? So injectivity, what does it mean to be non-injective? It means that you have two configurations, which are different, which have a different, uh, the same image. So it means that there is uh, two different B-infinite paths inside my Dobrun graph with the same labeling. But as we are in a finite automaton, if you have a B-infinite path, you can always, or a pair of B-infinite paths, you can always choose them so that on both sides they are periodic. You don't care if it's the same period on both sides, but so you have a cycle, then a finite part, then a cycle. And uh, as you might imagine, it's easy to uh, test this property. It's just yet again uh, a classical thing in the, in the sense of, uh, of uh, regular languages and uh, playing with that. So Amoroso and Pat also devised this way to test uh, for injectivity. And the question is, what about dimension two then? But I won't answer it yet. It's, a more, it's more complicated than dimension two. OK. Then maybe some people here are from uh, dynamics. And uh, they would say, uh, you sold us some dynamical system, and then you just look at one step. And uh, that's not dynamics. That's just taking the image. That's true. So let's take some more dynamical properties on those objects. And please correct me if I, my definitions are wrong yet again, maybe. OK, so I take a symbolic dynamical system with a subshift and a continuous map on it. And uh, what can I say? So you're periodic in time, that time, if uh, there is a power of your rule, which is the identity. You're ultimately periodic if it's uh, the case after some pre-period. You have invariant set of configurations in which you stay by applying the rule. And strongly invariant sets which are um, in which you stay, but you can go to the rule set by applying your rule on them. And then the simplest uh, kind of attractor that you can define on this, certainly, is the limit set. So the limit set is a Kloppen set, which you get by taking all the configurations, all the points in your system that you can see at every time. So it's the intersection of the image of uh, your map iterated n times, starting from your set V. And um, if you are lucky enough, all those are non-empty uh, club and set. And so, OK, you get something in the end. So then um, you have a notion of uh, attractor there. And uh, the, the one that I will be really interested in is for cellular automata a kind of maximal attractor that you get by taking V, the set of every configuration, and uh, F, some cellular automaton. So this is the definition for cellular automata. You have your set of configuration, you have your global rule, and you take the intersection of uh, all the images after n step of every configuration. This is a subshift because all my fn of SZs are non-empty subshift. They are uh, included into the next one. 
And uh, at first, it looks like uh, it contains configurations that might have different finite history. But we will see in a minute that, indeed, it's better than that. And I believe that's on the next slide. So we did space-time diagrams. I put time upwards. Some people put it downwards. Let's make peace. We will do B infinite space-time diagrams. Times will go both upwards and downwards. So a B infinite space-time diagrams uh, is just some space-time diagrams where time is uh, taken in Z. And you want every line to be the image of the configurations below and to have its image uh, upwards, right? So the configurations that you can uh, construct with B infinite space and diagrams are exactly the configurations which uh, constitute the limit set of the serial automata. At first, it might seem for some of you, to some of you, that I'm missing something. But let me draw a picture to convince you that it's true. So first, of course, if you are in a B infinite space time diagrams, you have ancestors at any time step, number of time steps. So you are in the limit set. But why is the converse true? Imagine that you have a configuration here, C, which possesses a predecessor for any number of time steps. It means that whatever finite segment that I take of size n around 0, I can draw a small square here, n by n, filled by state, so that there is a way to complete this so that it's uh, completely legal when using my serial automaton. Yes, I take a preimage at time n, and uh, I cut that square in the middle. I can do it for every n. Bigger than bigger than n. So I do an extraction on that b-dimensional object, if I am in dimension 1. And uh, I will get, for that particular configuration C, a whole set of predecessors for every time that will help me to fill the bottom part of my b-infinite space and diagrams. And I just apply the rule in the other direction. Yeah. So of course, you can do it in every dimension. There is no problem. So the limit set is the set of configurations that are in B-infinite space-time diagrams. That's the right way to look at it. So what can you have as a limit set? Maybe the simplest limit set, as it's, it's not empty, it would be a singleton, right? Singleton is. So what is the a B infinite space time diagram when your limit set is a singleton? As you are invariant in space, and of course, in a B infinite space time diagrams, all the configurations are in the limit set. The only possibility, if you have a singleton, is for the B infinite space time diagrams to be filled with a single color. So it's a bit boring, but people sell uh, white uh, paintings for a lot of money. so. It's just nilpotent is when you have a singleton. It's the simplest uh, possibility. And if you want a definition, OK, if you have a quiescent state Q, a CA is nilpotent if every configuration converts after some finite time to a completely uh, Q monochromatic configuration. And indeed, it's the same. OK, that's nilpotent. Can we do something simple but not monochromatic. Uh, we can construct cellular automata with a limit set, which is uh, an SFT. Here is an example in dimension 1. Let's imagine that you have zeros and 1. And uh, what you do is that uh, you enter state 1 only if you see 1, 0, 0 in your previous uh, neighbors. Then you will see something like that, right? In the beginning, you might have blocks of one that will not do uh, interesting things. And uh, after that, uh, you would have some isolated particles that will move to the right. So what is the limit set? The limit set is simply the set of configuration when, where you don't see two consecutive ones, or you don't see a zero in between two ones. 
So that's SFT. Another example of an SFT. This is the max rule. So you have two states, 0 and 1. And the local rule is uh, I look at my three neighbors and I take the max of the value I, I can see there. Then the limit set uh, is a bit more complicated to write down. But uh, the intuition is that if you have only zeros, you keep your zero. If you have only ones, you keep one. If you have islands of one, they will expand inside the zeros. So if you have a configuration with uh, zeros on one side, one on the other side, the one will uh, shift to the left. <laughs> and so the limit set, it consists of configuration with only zeros, configuration with only ones, configurations with zeros and ones, uh, which are, uh, it's shift invariant, so I don't put the zeros there, uh, which are zero on the left, one on the right, or the opposite, or you might have also finite islands of zeros. Why? Because you can construct, of course, a B-infinite diagram where you have your zeros here coming from a shrinking infinite pyramid of zeros. Something like that. It's a valid diagram. And that's all. So the, the subshift is uh, avoiding all configurations where you have a finite islands of one with zeros on both sides, which is uh, countable, which is uh, also uh, rational, regular, but uh, it's not finite. Let me give another example of, uh, of a funny uh, simple rule. This is a majority. So rather than max now, as I see three neighbors, I can take the majority of what I see. So I have zeros and ones. When I see more zeros and ones, I go to zero. When I see more ones, I go to one. And then what is the limit set? It's a bit more tricky. You can uh, think about it. Yeah, there are some hints on the board, because you see when you have a checkerboard pattern, it is preserved, for example. So you need to have checkerboard patterns inside the, your limit set. And uh, I gave a set of. Uh, configuration to consider when trying to find this uh, limit set. But I, I think I will not uh, <coughs> construct the answer yet, because I see that I still have 25 slides to show and 30 minutes. So, uh, But you might think about it. Uh, so we have SFT, we have SOFIC. Can we do better? Actually, we can do uh, more complex things. Yes. Uh, so what does this say? Uh, if you look at the language of the limit set, of course, it completely characterizes the limit set of those automata. And uh, we can prove, for example, that if the limit set is an SFT, then you have to reach it in a finite number of steps. Why is it so? Uh, the intuition be behind that is that um, if you think about forbidden worlds in the limit set, when you take f to the n and you increase the value of n, if you discover no new forbidden world at step n, then uh, you will uh, have reached the limit set. So your rule has to discover new minimal forbidden worlds uh, each time. And uh, what can we say otherwise? Yes, Wait. so if you are SFT, then you stop at some finite number of steps. And the reciprocal is under reciprocal. If you step at a finite number of steps, then you are the image of all the configuration by a finite automaton. So you are sophic. That's the definition of suffix, so it's not complicated to give it that way. Uh, we can say a little bit more about limit set. For example, if you are not nilpotent, if you have at least two distinct configurations in the limit set, then you have infinitely many of them, and you have uh, a non-periodic one, uh, especially. So 
This one, if you want to try to prove it, you can uh, use some clever extraction. You take uh, the definition of what it means not to be nilpotent. You look at the space-time diagrams, mini-finite space-time diagrams uh, of non-nilpotent configurations. And from there, you should be able to construct your non-spatially periodic element. So how, um, how strange can the limit set be? Actually, it can be quite ugly. So first, you can construct cellular automata with uh, co-recursively enumerable, uh, um, oh, oh, sorry, the, the language is also always co-recursively enumerable, but you can construct cellular automata with non-recursive limit sets. Why is it co-recursively enumerable? Uh, I don't know if everybody knows what co-recursively enumerable means. It means basically that there is a program that is able, uh, here for the limit set, um, to to tell you if uh, world is forbidden or not in this limit set. So you give the CA, you give your word, it computes. If this word is forbidden in the limit set, at some point it will stop and tell you, yes, it's forbidden. And if it's not forbidden, it might stop and tell you uh, that it's not, or it might not stop, actually. And there is this nice uh, characterization by Erd. You take any co-recursively enumerable language, and you can embed it into the limit set of a cellular automaton. So it can be very ugly, actually. So a corollary of that is that, of course, there are non-recursively uh, non -recursive limit sets. So in general, we cannot describe, uh, in a mechanical way, the limit set of a CA that you give as an input. Uh, okay, and then uh, you can play to construct uh, lots of uh, nice CA with funny limit set. For example, you can try to build a cell automaton whose limit set uh, as a language which is not uh, uh, rational, but context-free. One way to do it is to consider, of course, uh, A and B N or parentheses, something like that, the classical example from uh, language theory. And a way to do this in cellular automata is to consider particles that move in opposite direction and bounce when they meet. Then um, if you put, for example, oh, oh, you can take just that. Or uh, if you want to, to do something uh, more clear, you can put a vertical uh, particle also. And when they meet at the vertical particle, they bounce. Otherwise, they, they are destroyed. <laughs> and if you look at the language, the distance between the particles and, and uh, that vertical particle should be the same. So you have your A and B in there. Sorry. Yep. What is the rational language? Uh, regular language. Does it, it make more sense that way or no? Yeah. Yeah, I tend to use rational sometimes. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the same, no? Cleany? Yep. OK. Uh, you can do also uh, uh, something which is not context-free. So you can, of course, put E and B and C and there just by playing with new rules. Uh, and even you can do non-recursive uh, directly yourself. So consider um, um, some uh, cellular automata that would uh, simulate Turing machines. There is a way to... Uh, use this to construct some non-recursive um, <coughs> CA in a two-dimensional cellular automaton. So you put the space-time diagram of your Turing machine. What is the space-time diagram of the Turing machine? It's just the piling of the configuration of the Turing machine. And uh, it's easy with a local rule to check if what you see is a valid space-time diagram of a Turing machine, right? You look in two dimensions. So uh, if you consider that cellular automaton, then uh, it's easy to convince yourself then that the limit set cannot be uh, recursive. Yes. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You make the tape at, so uh, at a certain step, and then the, the uh, I mean, above you have the, the tape of the Turing machine at the 
So, so in, in the, con the configuration is bidimensional, like the floor here. You have the, the configurations uh, horizontally, which are the tape, actually, with the head somewhere written on the tape, on the cell it considers. And uh, the, on my floor, above, I have the image configuration. I continue like that. And, uh, and that's the first ingredient. Then from that, you can build the CA with uh, non-recursive language. Then, of course, what your CA does is check that it's valid and take decision based on that. And if you, do this, you want to do the same in dimension one, you take, uh, for example, the intrinsically universal cellular automata from first part, and uh, you use them to, to get uh, um, a CA with an unrecursive uh, one day limit set. Guillaume is thinking. Let's wait. No? We can, we can talk about it after one. But indeed, it's, that's the idea. OK. Uh, let me advance there. So, so I'm almost done with that part. Um, so what happens if you look at your limit set? It's a set of configuration which is invariant, so it makes sense to ask the question if what happens for injectivity, subjectivity there. So if you take your restriction to the limit set, first you are always subjective. By definition, the limit set is your attractor, and uh, when you are inside the limit set, you stay inside it, and uh, you reach all of it. But we can say a little bit more there. For example, there is a nice uh, result by uh, Siamak Tati that was supposed to give this talk uh, in the beginning. And he proved that uh, if you are injective uh, uh, on your limit set, then you reach it in finite time. OK, that was, that was part two. And I have a part three. So if you have no question about part two, other than the one that Guillaume is considering right now about the limit set, I will move to the last part. OK. So I confirm that uh, there exists uh, intrinsically universal CA with simple limit set. Yeah, sure. That was not what I was saying. Yeah. OK. The one you choose works. It's the, yeah, yeah. So it's the brick you use to construct the but the same way that with particle, you just don't you don't just take particles and you have what you want. You need to work a little bit. But there is a generic construction. You give me the the intrinsically universal CA and uh, I put some uh, stuff on it, some widgets, and it works. Okay, to the funny part, the, to the main part, undecidability in in cellular automata. So. First, uh, a short, short introduction to what Chaim will say just after. Uh, I don't have hats there, I'm sorry, because I'm on ZD. So there is a, this very old problem by Wang, uh, which is the following. I, I just copied what he wrote because I think it's very nicely written. But uh, the problem uh, talks about plates. Now we are more using uh, unit squares with colored edges, but maybe plates is a better way to see it. So you have a finite collection of uh, unit squares with colors on the, the edges, which are given to you. Here I have four of them, A, B, C, D. Each of those squ uh, squares has uh, these nice colors, and uh, you are allowed to take as many copies of each plate as you, uh, square as you want. You are not allowed to rotate or to return your unit square. You can only translate the square in the plane. And what you want to do is to cover a B infinite configuration with uh, those unit squares by putting them into the cells. So it's a tiling which would be edge by edge, right? It's not really tiling, it's more symbolic dynamics, actually. So, um, for my four plates, it's easy to see that you can indeed recover the, the whole plane, because if you consider this small patch of three by two uh, tiles, 
you see that inside the patch, the colors are the same along each edge, so it's okay, the tailing constraints are valid. And uh, the left side has the same colors as the right side, and the top side has the same colors as the bottom side, so you can use that patch and uh, put it periodically into the plane to cover the whole plane. It would be nice if, uh, in general, given the plate, you could decide if you can cover the plane, right? That would be nice. So, of course, as we talk about Turing machine, you know that there is a problem which is not far away, which is undecidable. I give you a, a collection of plates, like that, of, of, of tiles. Uh, those tiles are constructed to mimic a Turing machine in some way. Let's see how. Um, so, I have that red arrows that uh, are used to construct some initial uh, configuration where I have some uh, blank letters and I have a tape on a specific letter. I have some right tile to fill the bottom part of the plane because time goes up, so there is nothing below zero, right? And so I also have a set of plates that are used both to propagate my letters when there is no head around and to do the local computation and the movement of the head. So if I consider this set of uh, tiles, of course it tiles the plane. You just take the tile on the right and you fill it and ta-da, you have a tiling. But if I ask you to find the tiling where this yellow tile is put in zero, then it's more complicated, of course, because you can tile the plane only if the Turing machine that uh, I have endowed into it does not stop. Because if it stopped, uh, I don't have the transition for that. So there are tiling problems with constraint. Here is a fixed tile, which are undecidable. And all the trick is to find a way to embed that into the general tiling problem to get it undecidable too. So if we add more time, and I think we stop at 11, right, Ville? Uh, yeah. yeah, so if we add more time, I would discuss how you do this with, for finite tilings, for tiling with diagonal constraint. But let me speed up a little bit. So Berger proved in 64. Maybe you've seen 66 on some slide, but I like to quote the PhD here because it's published somehow. So in 64, he, he proved that uh, it's undecidable, given a, a finite set of one tile, to decide if you can tie the plane with it. How do you do that? So the key ingredient is that there exists a periodic tile set, set of tiles that tie the plane, but they cannot tie it uh, with a repetition of a finite pattern. And for details about that, I think the next talk would be very great. So what's the idea of the proof for the uh, undecidability? You use some aperiodic tile set to put um, some hierarchical um, self-similar structure on, on every configuration. And when you have that kind of hierarchical structure, you see that it constructs uh, squares of every possible size, and it does it um, in the wool tiling. Then, into each of those squares, you embed the start of a computation. To be able to fill the wool tiling, you need to have computations of every possible side, size, sorry, length. So uh, it means that your Turing machine should not stop. And there are a lot of ways to do this, and a lot of nice aperiodic tile sets. Uh, I think everybody does one at some point, so I have one, which is uh, not completely uh, readable here because of the light, but uh, basically it's always the idea to construct those, uh, those squares. So th that tiling problem is undecidable, and uh, building from that, you get undecidability result on several automata easily. So let me state one problem, which is quite natural, uh, after what I said uh, in, the, in part two. So nil potent means that every configuration reaches uh, a common fixed point at first time, right? So the natural question is, I give you a cellular automaton, and you want to check if it's nil potent. So first, you 
might see that if a serial automaton is nilpotent, then it's also uniformly nilpotent. What I, do I mean by that? Every configuration reaches a fixed point which is monochromatic, but there is a particular time bound so that after that time, every configuration has entered that monochromatic configuration. Why is it so? Uh, one way to see it is that you can construct a configuration which is universal for finite patterns. You take all possible finite patterns, you put them in the same space, that configuration after time t goes to monochromatic, and so all the other configurations, they have patterns which appear there, so in time t also they are monochromatic. So actually, testing this potency is the same as bounding recursively that time after which you get uh, to nil potency. Blah, 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 limit set. Uh, B-infinite space-time diagrams, you know that. And nil potent is the same as singleton. OK, so of course, this problem is undecidable because everything is undecidable, right? So in two dimensions, how does it work? In two dimensions, the idea is uh, simple. We will encode a set of one tiles into a cellular automaton so that when the set of tiles do not tile the plane, my cellular automaton is nilpotent. And when the set of tiles tiles the plane, it's not important. How do you do that? So uh, the problem with uh, wonk tiles is that uh, sometimes if you, you put tiles at random on the floor, they might be incompatible tiles side by side. So we take the set of tiles two as an input. We use some special error state, a spreading error state. And the rule of the cellular automaton is very basic. If I am an error state, I stay in error state. If I am a tile from the tile set, I look at my neighbors. If everything is correct, I stay in the same state. Otherwise, I enter the error state. What happens there? Uh, if there is no tiling because of extraction and capacity argument, there exists a size of a square so that you cannot tile that square. So if I cannot tile the plane, in, in every uh, square of that side, inside my configuration, at least one cell will enter the error state. Then it will spread, and in time n, everybody will be in error state. If there is a tiling, if you put a valid tiling, it's boring because no cells evolve, but still, it's not going to the fixed point. So this is how you prove uh, undecidability in two dimensions. And uh, you can also do it in one dimension, but it's a bit more tricky. It's a result by Yarko Kari uh, that uh, um, will be there in week three. Actually, week three is about uh, its 16th birthday. So certainly, we will talk about things like that. Uh, also, for surjectivity and injectivity in two dimensions, it is indeed undecidable, given a local rule, to test for the property. It is also a result by Yarko Kari from uh, the 90s. So I don't have time for the proof here, but uh, it's very nice. It uses some uh, tilings, plus some kind of uh, space filling curve, plus some uh, cellular automaton in dimension one on top of that uh, path. And um, with this clever engineering, uh, you can reduce the tiling problem to those uh, surjectivity and injectivity problem. OK. And in dimension one, that's what I was saying before. So you take your tilings, you take your wrong tiles, and you consider a variant of it. So what did I say there? OK, the spreading state, I talked about it already. Uh, so there is this remark which is important. If you have a spreading state, you are nilpotent if and only if there is a space-time space diagram without errors. This is, um, this is also an argument using extraction. And uh, the idea is that if you are not nilpotent, then you can find segments without spreading state of any size. And from that, you do a configuration without uh, spreading state. And so, how do you go from tilings to one dimension? 
the idea is to put restrictions on your tile set. So until now, our tiles were checking uh, their neighbors for valid colors. What we will consider are northwest deterministic uh, tiles, tile sets, in a northwest deterministic tile set. Given your north and west neighboring tiles, there is at least one way, at most one way, to fill the tile. If you do that, you, you can easily, with a cellular automaton, given a diagonal of your tiling, which is a valid diagonal, construct the next diagonal. <laughs> and so you take the two-dimensional tiling by that kind of, of tile set and put it in 1D. And the trick is first to prove that uh, tiling is still undecidable when you are northwest deterministic. So you do it in the tiling world. And then you do the reduction. And it's also a result by Yarko Kari from 92, actually. But I think someone found an older proof that actually is equivalent to that. I don't remember the name of the author of the previous proof. I know the anonymous person that found it. It's, he's not in this room. Ville, do you know what paper Emmanuel uh, pointed that proves uh, that impotency is undecidable? Uh, can you repeat the question? What? So, so uh, um, Emmanuel Jander uh -huh. found um, an older reference that proves that uh, more yeah, or yeah, less yeah. Okay, okay. Under and Lewis from uh, 70. Uh, about 70 something. I 70 think. something. Andera yes. and. Andera yeah. and Lewis. And Lewis, okay. Yes. yes. I should definitely revise my slide for that. Okay, let me see what I want to say. This I said already. Uh, ah, yes, also I have uh, some results by uh, Pierre Guillon here. Okay. Um, it's worse than that, actually. Uh, if you take a property on limit sets, any property, just like you have Rice theorem for Turing machines, you have Rice theorem for limit sets. So basically, if you ask a given a set of cellular, a given a cellular automaton in input, if its limit set has some property which is a property defined only on the subshift, either the property is trivial, meaning every automaton satisfies it, or it will be undecidable, more or less. Um, and uh, Pierre Guillon and uh, Gaëtan Richard prove that it's still true if you fix the alphabet of the automaton. And um, if you play with the definition of nipotency also, uh, you get the same kind of result. I'm sorry, I have three minutes, no, two and a half left, so I won't enter details. I will just show you two slides. So it's not just nipotency. If you take, for example, uh, periodicity, the fact that there is an iteration of the rule, which is identity, this property also is undecidable for cellular automata. Um, we did this with Yarko Gary in 2008. But I want to, to stop my talk with an open problem. And it's a problem uh, which is more related to, to dynamics. So a cellular automata is positively expansive if when you are given uh, the some, uh, if, uh, actually, if there exists some size epsilon, so that uh, from the, that bound into the space-time diagram, the red one, you can reconstruct the initial configuration, whatever the initial configuration was. And uh, this question of deciding positive expansivity is uh, becoming old. I think now it's, it's been around for about 20 and something years. Uh, and if you have ideas about this, please contact us. We would like to solve this. Thank you for your attention. OK, so let us thank the speaker. Okay. Uh, any questions? There's got to be some questions. Some idea about, yeah. Uh, the last question is essentially whether it uh, uniformly repels the, the I'm, I'm asking about the, 
if I can, because attracting is essentially making it closer to the limit set. So here yeah. you're just demanding <coughs> that they stay away. It, uh, so positively expansive, more or less, it means that wherever you put yourself in space, if you wait long enough, you see all the information from the initial configuration. Of course, uh, yeah, it implies subjectivity. So the limit set is uh, the whole set of configurations there. Even it implies that uh, every configuration has the same number of predecessors. So it's in a very particular class of several automata. OK, thanks. Any other questions? Everybody wants, wants to have lunch. Maybe one uh, slight comment from me. No, I just want to point out that this theorem from 2008, can you go back to the uh, the, uh, the previous, this Guillaume Rich Richard result. Yes. So you are stating, so th what you're stating here is actually very easy to prove. Uh, so you're so this is the playing with the uh, order so that you are just saying uh, for every individual configuration uh, every column is no 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 no, no. okay but this is yeah. often called asymptotic nil potency and weak nil yeah. potency is something yeah. else sorry I didn't read the formula because no, no. I read the name every quantifier ah, is okay important. so yeah. so then I don't have actual comments other than I would I would call this asymptotic nil potency but actually the result is quite nice uh, it's this construction with this uh, yeah yeah this is a very nice result yes okay so. Thank you.